Good afternoon. I'm Elder D.C. Edmond, and I am the director of the Office of Regional Conference Ministries. And we are happy to welcome you to this special edition of First Sabbath, which is actually on a la on a last Sabbath this month. Uh, we'll continue with our regular First Sabbath um, on next Sabbath. And we'll talk to you a little bit about that in a minute. I have some people that I am very excited to introduce to you today. And I'll do that at this time. Um, start stepping in as our guest host uh, today is Elder Christian Josiah, who is the Vice President for Administration for the Central States Conference, which is headquartered in Kansas City, Kansas. Elder Josiah is a son of a pastor, a church, a longtime church administrator in the um, Caribbean Union. Um, and he's been with us before. So Elder Josiah, we welcome you. Thank you for uh, stepping in for Pastor Hoy, who's working behind the scenes today um, to help make this thing work. And we welcome back our usual guest, uh, our usual co-host, Ms. Rebecca Bell Jackson, an, um, an educator and a doctoral student at Howard University. Uh, past, uh, Ms. Uh, Jackson, welcome. Glad to have you as always. We are uh, we are privileged to have as our guest today the president of the General Co Conference, the leader of our World Church. He is here primarily to talk about structure and mission. So I'm going to ask though, those of you who do send in questions, if you will limit your questions to structure. That is, how, how is the general conference? How's the general conference set up? What does it do? Uh, and mission. What what is it about? If you can limit your questions to your questions from the audience to those items, we would be very appreciative. At this time, um, I'd like to welcome to and bring on to the screen the leader of the World Church. Dr. Ted N.C. Wilson. Welcome, Elder Wilson. Thank you for uh, uh, ag agreeing to be a guest on First Sabbath, and we look forward to you sharing with us uh, primarily on structure and mission of our world church. Thank you, Elder Hammond, and uh, it's a great privilege to share about God's church and his Advent movement and his word, and his soon coming, and that's uniting us all. Thank you so much. We Our program normally is 90 minutes. This time, uh, we are only going to be able to do a 60-minute program. Dr. Wilson has other engagements. We're just glad, um, given your, um, given your the demands on your time on the world field. I remember when you came to preach for us at South Central when I was there. I remember asking you, where are you going from here? And you told me you were gonna be gone for the next six weeks. Uh, and so um, I know you have a number of things to do and for carving out this time, giving us an hour, we're very, we're very appreciative. And so we wanna get started. So Ms. Jackson, if you'll lead us off, please. Of course, let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for bringing us here today, and we pray that we will learn about your church and that we will be united as we prepare for your soon coming to win souls to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And if you have um, questions about church structure, please feel free to put them in the chat so that we can ask your question live with Dr. Wilson. Hello, Dr. Wilson. Great to see you, Rebecca. Good to see you. So we'd like to start off with you telling us a little bit about yourself and your ministry and things that led you to leadership in the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Well, I'll try to be brief. Um, I was uh, born in Tacoma Park, Maryland, 10 days after my parents returned on furlough, having spent six years in the country of Egypt. So I was almost born on the boat. And uh, then when I was six months old, they went back to Egypt for about another seven and a half, eight years. So I grew up in the country where Jesus spent two years, where Moses grew up, and where the pharaohs lived. Um, it was an incredible experience. In fact, 
I never came back to the United States until I was eight years old. And uh, the only thing I knew about the United States was that's where Blue Jeans came from and Eric B. Hare Records. That's about it. Everything else was culture of Egypt. And I still consider myself down in my deepest heart an Egyptian. Uh, it was an incredible experience. I'm what you call, uh, some people will know, a, a third culture kid. You have the culture of your parents, you have the culture of your host country, and those two mix into an interesting third culture. And uh, children and young people who have grown up in different parts of the world with that background, it's a unique perspective on the world, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, I was privileged to grow up in the wonderful Christian home. Uh, my mother and father, uh, precious parents, uh, they, they were so nurturing and encouraging to me. In fact, uh, one little saying, and I would share it with everybody, I hope you can use it as grandparents, as parents, as potential parents, uh, to your children. My, my parents, and especially my dad, he'd say, Ted, we believe in you. You know, with so much negativity going around and so many challenging things in terms of even people's character and personality, to have people believe in you, your own parents, it's such a, a beautiful thing. I also remember something from my childhood, and it has remained with me through my entire life. I never, ever heard my mother or my father ever say anything negative about the word of God or about the spirit of prophecy. Everything was so positive, so encouraging. And, uh, you know, to place my life in God's hands, that's what was really important in our family. Uh, I've lived in different places. My, of course, being the son of a pastor, you move around a bit. And uh, live, I've lived in Egypt, obviously, and then in California, uh, in, in Washington area. Uh, I graduated from what was then known as Columbia Union College with a double major in religion and business. Uh, that was encouragement from my father to get perspectives from different aspects. I had the privilege of uh, working in the Greater New York Conference as a pastor. Uh, they also sponsored me to the seminary and the school of what is known as School of Public Health at Loma Linda. And one of the most beautiful things about that is that I met my wife at Loma Linda. And uh, precious uh, wife, Nancy Vollmer Wilson. And uh, she comes from a very strong denominational family also. Her father was a physician, her mother a nurse, her grandfather a physician. And he was one of those individuals who, back in those days, they ordained uh, physicians. And he was a pastor and a physician. He was in charge of Loma Linda Hospital, in charge of St. Helena Hospital, but a very humble, godly person. And um, the, we have three wonderful daughters. I mean, they're just fantastic. Uh, two of them are... I should give their names, Emily, Elizabeth, and Catherine. And two of them are married to uh, pastors. And one, our youngest, is married to a dentist. And uh, they are all faithful, Bible-believing, Seventh-day Adventist members. And we just praise God. In fact, as a parent, that's probably the greatest happiness that anyone can have. And we have 10 grandchildren. Uh, five girls and five boys. And uh, we had another wonderful little grandson. He died uh, last June uh, from a very unfortunate um, uh, terminal illness that he had for a considerable time. He was almost eight years old. But we'll see him soon. The Lord is coming very, very soon. Uh, it's been a privilege to work in uh, New York in uh, Africa. Uh, I worked in the Africa Indian Ocean Division, as it was known then. We spent about nine years in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire, and uh, picked up French there, and that was a, a big blessing. Uh, and then we have worked in, um, 
in the Euro-Asia division, living in Moscow, in Russia, incredible experience. Uh, just wouldn't trade those experiences for anything. And we have wonderful friends all over the world. So I've also worked at the Review and Herald for about four plus years, worked in the General Conference and Secretariat and in as a vice president. And for the last few years, uh, been privileged to, to uh, serve in whatever capacity I could uh, in this present position. So that's a real thumbnail sketch, but I just praise God for what God has done in my life and, um, and for the years of service that I've been able to have overseas outside of this country, living and uh, in service almost 19, 20 years and 16 of those years on the continent of Africa. Absolutely fantastic experience. Wow, what a resume. Well, tell us a little bit about your father and your grandfather who were also leaders in our church. Do you mind sharing some things about them? Well, I'll tell you, my, I'll start out very quickly. My great-grandfather uh, was a Methodist and uh, from Ireland and ended up in Northern California. Uh, my great-grandmother became a Seventh-day Adventist through some contacts, but my great-grandfather never did until he went to a, a camp meeting. And uh, at that camp meeting, Ellen White was speaking. And she made, after a wonderful sermon, I assume, I don't know what she spoke on, but she made an appeal. And my great-grandfather, to the great surprise of my great-grandmother, he stood up and went forward and gave his heart completely to the Lord, became a faithful Seventh-day Adventist and a lay leader in Northern California. And uh, the Wilson family is so grateful, not only to the prophetic instructional ministry of Ellen White, but to the personal invitation of following Jesus to my great grandfather. Out of that family, there were four brothers and one of them was my grandfather. He became a worker in self-supporting work for a while. And then a long career in the church uh, in four different divisions uh, and in the North American division, of course, and lastly serving as uh, president of the Michigan Conference. And then he went into retirement. But uh, Rebecca, he didn't, he didn't stop pastoring until he was probably about 85 years old. And uh, it, it, he was a wonderful grandfather, wonderful grandmother that I had. My, my father uh, and my mother, precious people, my my father uh, has had a long experience in the church, uh, missionary in Egypt, and president of the Columbia Union, president of North American Division, president of the General Conference, uh, a religious liberty specialist, uh, had a great love for religious liberty, and uh, worked in that area in the Columbia Union. And I have, I have gained from his experience also a deep love for religious liberty, uh, and, and try to promote that in a, in a wonderful way. It was my father who encouraged me to take a call from the Greater New York Conference to go to New York City and that environment. And he said, if you really want to challenge, go to New York. And ever since that time, I have had such a burden for the cities and it has inspired me. I mean, when you read in, in Matthew 9, uh, verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You begin to understand the compassion, because it, it says in the next verse, he had compassion for them. And that's why I have a great burden for the cities. And uh, it's just an enormous challenge that we have, that God has yet to, to fully uh, fulfill in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I just want to express enormous appreciation to the regional conferences for their great emphasis on working in the cities. And this is where the people are. More people live in the cities now than live in the rural areas of the entire globe. So it's just an incredible opportunity. My father was also a great nurturer uh, for me and for many others. And I remember one thing, when I was a freshman in college, I was away from 
the Washington area. And he sent to me in his own handwriting a beautiful uh, copy of Steps to Christ, page 70. I won't read it all because our time is limited, but you know this quotation. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. And it goes on. And he wrote that in his own handwriting. Of course, that was before, you know, uh, laptops and all that kind of thing. But I want to tell you, as parents, as grandparents, take a little time to pay attention to your children and spiritually encouraging, encourage them. It meant so much for me and even to this very day. And as I was going to Africa to work in the African and Ocean Division, uh, Dad encouraged me, I think, to, to talk to different people, get perspectives, get encouragement. And one of the best things that I ever uh, was able to, to do was to spend time with Elder E.E. E. Cleveland. At that time, he was a very, I think he had just finished working in the Ministerial Association and he gave me so much information. I was going out as a ministerial secretary. And uh, I remember one thing he told me, and it was really a credit to him. He was telling me about all these things, you know, and I should be doing this. And, and then he said somebody complained to the general conference about him. And the complaint was, this man produceth too much stuff. And that was a real compliment. And so I learned a lot from Elder Cleveland in terms of the ministerial aspects. And in my own life, my parents, my grandparents were such models to me. And um, others that I could mention, uh, Elder C.D. Brooks and a wonderful mentor, Elder G. Ralph Thompson. I just called just the other day to his daughter to ask how Elder Thompson was doing. And, uh, you know, he's doing okay. But we need to remember those who have retired and are kind of off on the periphery. But so many people have helped, including my parents and grandparents, to help me in terms of being a leader and a pastor, because really I'm a pastor. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. All right. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Wilson, for being with us. And I know for the sake of time and I know we shared in our advertising that we would have a candid dialogue. Uh, and so and, and so I know, thank you, Elder Edmund, for sharing that some questions we may not be able to, 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 to feel. Uh, for those who don't know, can you tell us a little bit on what is the General Conference? What are some of the main functions of the General Conference within the Seventh-day Adventist uh, church structure for those uh, who don't know why we may be relevant or, or what's the reason for our existence? Well, Pastor Josiah, the, the main thing that people generally know is their pastor and they may know their conference president. Uh, other mm -hmm. than that, in fact, when I got married to my precious wife, Nancy, that's about all she knew. She, I think she may have known who the general conference president was, but structure didn't mean a whole lot because really ministry is locally based. But the structure of the church is a representative uh, organization. We have a general conference session normally every five years. And uh, that session uh, helps to nominate people uh, it goes through theological aspects. If there are any things, anything that needs to be adjusted in fundamental beliefs, and not that we change our fundamental beliefs, but helping to sharpen it. Uh, it, it talks uh, about the constitution and bylaws. Now that's at the session level. Then uh, out of that, a general conference executive committee is established. And we have about 343 or so church uh, members who are members of the executive committee of the general conference. We just had a meeting on Thursday morning, uh, just uh, this last week. And uh, then the general conference itself, leaders are chosen at the session in administration, that's presidential, secretariat, treasury, and uh, departmental areas. Uh, the divisions are divisions of the general conference. They don't have their own constituency. 
they are divisions of the general conference. So we assign activity, uh, administrative activity for those particular areas to a division structure. But the divisions report to the general conference and we work together in a very, very close relationship. We have 13 world divisions and three attached fields. Uh, the attached fields are the Middle East North Africa Union Mission and the China Chinese Union Mission. Uh, we also have the Israel field, which is attached to the general conference. And so that's the structure. Then of course, underneath each one of those union uh, divisions, we have unions. Unions really are the building blocks of the actual general conference, because as I mentioned, Divisions are divisions of the general conference. Uh, for instance, the inter-American division is not the inter-American inter division of Seventh-day Adventists. It's the inter-American division of the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists. So we have unions. Many times they may, maybe they will contain different countries in one union or portions of a country in a union or a country as a union. Then we have local conferences or local missions, local sections as some may call it. And then we have the most important area and that is the local church. The general conference tries to give a vision, tries to keep people focused on our true purpose of being, why God has called the Seventh-day Adventist church into being. This is not just another denomination, not just another church, it is a prophetic movement with a prophetic mission with a absolutely unique group of people to proclaim that message. And we're hoping to gather many more people into this uh, wonderful Advent movement. So theologically, the General Conference tries to keep things moving according to scripture and the counsel from the spirit of prophecy. Uh, it is to remind our people we are the remnant church and that we have a message to share the three angels messages of Revelation 14 and the fourth angel of Revelation 18, calling people back to the true worship of God and preparing people for the soon coming of the Lord. At our annual councils uh, that we have every year, uh, we do go over policies. I have with me the the policy book of, of the General Conference. And this policy book is, is created by the entire world church representation. And of course, in, in policy, it does indicate, I could read it to you, but we don't have much time, that uh, every organization all over the world is to strictly adhere to what we all agree together. Now, that's not the Bible. The Bible is our, 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 our rule of faith. But the policies are agreements that we all come up together with in order to keep us moving ahead. And that's done by the entire world church at annual councils. So the general conference kind of supervises, helps to keep things moving, gives vision, and tries to encourage people with our purpose for being. Thank you. Thank you. Elder Eminem, am I taking the next question from the audience? We want to take some questions um, from the audience. Um, let's go to Miss let's go to Miss Jackson's next question. I'll and if you don't mind, I'll um, address the questions from the audience to Dr. Wilson. All right, Dr. Wilson. So share what job duties you perform. What do you do every day? You've got your Bible and you've got your book. What do you do all day? <laughs> Well, uh, I do keep busy. Let me put it that way. We have lots of meetings and uh, obviously during uh, COVID, which has impacted us enormously, uh, just as it has everybody, uh, we have lots of meetings on Zoom or some electronic uh, format. Uh, the, the work of the church has not uh, stopped at all. In fact, witnessing has gone to new heights using social media and communication methods. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to see how uh, God is working in a very practical way through people and through the church. 
So my day consists of uh, meetings uh, now on Zoom, a lot of it, although we are back in the office to a great, to certain extent. Uh, we still have meetings on Zoom, but uh, we're, you know, trying to edge back into a more normal setting. In fact, this last week was probably one of the most normal weeks I've had in about 23 months or so, 22 months. But, uh, you know, I do a lot of planning for the future. I do an, an, a lot of emails, contacts with our divisions, our officers, and with my fellow officers. Uh, and it's just a privilege to work with so many very, very competent people who are able to accomplish much and who are extremely dedicated to the church. Of course, my generally speaking, when we were traveling a lot, we were doing an enormous amount of traveling, uh, perhaps as much as almost 50% or more uh, at times traveling to uh, places all across the globe. And uh, that consumed quite a bit of time uh, in addition to all of the administrative activities. We're planning for different meetings, etc. cetera. Uh, I do try to hold one evangelistic meeting every year in order to stay very close, not only to the people, but to our precious message. And let me tell you, every time I preach those precious evangelistic messages, it's basically like I get reconverted myself. It's just so exciting to preach Bible truth. But anyway, um, I do stay busy. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> Sounds like it. Okay, we have, um, uh, we, we are about to show you a little video clip about our blood drive, and then we'll come back with a question uh, or two from the audience blood is just something it just feels like it's just a gift it, i don't want anything back in return but if i know it can help at least one person i feel good knowing that that one person has a chance to live it's important to me as uh, you know an african-american you know to donate blood i started donating blood maybe about seven years ago when a friend of mine her son had sickle cell and she wanted to have a blood drive, so we put one together, and ever since then I've been donating blood. I keep coming back because I know the importance of um, blood donations. I've had several co-workers and friends who have really benefited from the fact of uh, people donating blood. I have several friends that have had to have blood transfusions even here recently, so it's just compelled me to take another step and do what I could to help them out. You never know when you may need blood or someone close to you may need blood. You know, I understand, you know, we're coming out during the time of the pandemic, but uh, I had no problems coming out. It was a great experience. The staff is great, easy to work with, funny, and make it pleasant for you. The American Red Cross has all the safety measures in place. It was straightforward. Mask, took your temperature at the front desk, had sanitizer available. Oh, the process is very safe. Um, I felt welcomed. I felt comforted. Um, I am not one that really likes needles, um, but again, because I am so passionate about the fact of giving back, I make that sacrifice. And I just keep coming back because I know how important it is. So I um, just encourage anybody who wants to give back to their community to come and do it. Once you give, you'll keep giving because you realize how many people you are actually helping. We're saving lives. Every little bit counts. And we're back. Thank you very much. That is a part of the regional conference blood drive that we will be doing on the in the month of April. We are specifically targeting uh, the weekend of April 30th, and uh, we'll have more to share with you relative to that um, at the end of our program. We have a question from the audience. It, it, this president has to do with the president's advisory. Um, can you share who's on that group um, and um, how they how they got on that group? Well, uh, the president's executive advisory is simply an advisory of the senior leadership, uh, which is primarily 
uh, the president, the vice presidents, uh, the secretary and undersecretary, the treasurer and under treasurer, and uh, then the assistants to the president. So those are individuals who can give advice and encouragement, counsel. Uh, we just met just a few days ago at a wonderful place called uh, Living Hope Retreat Center, which is run by Mark and Teeny Finley in Northern Virginia. Uh, it was very inexpensive for us to meet there, especially during COVID. And we're being very careful about our finances and uh, how we approach things. Uh, that particular group meets uh, maybe once or twice a year and simply goes over various plans that we have for the future and activities which uh, we can help to inspire our church members in terms of of how to do mission work and evangelistic outreach and treating on various questions that may come up. Uh, that particular group has no uh, executive function. Uh, they're simply individuals who uh, provide advice and encouragement and visioning for the world church. All right. Um, we know that the plans for general conference have been interrupted because of the pandemic. So, Miss um, Jackson, let, let's 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 talk about the the next general conference. Yes, sir. When is the next general conference? Let's start there. <laughs> when is it, and how will it be conducted in this um, pandemic? Well, Ms. Jackson, uh, it will be uh, June six to eleven of 2022, uh, Lord willing, and praise God, it looks like everything is headed for that uh, in the, the tremendous city of St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, that will be two years delayed from when it was supposed to be held uh, in Indianapolis in 2020. But because of COVID, we've had to delay it two years. And uh, unfortunately, Indianapolis was not able to accommodate us for 2022, but St. Louis was. And in fact, if the Lord isn't here in 2025, uh, it'll be held in St. Louis again. So I think St. Louis was, you know, wanting to make sure that they they were very uh, cordial and hospitable. And so it'll be meeting there. Uh, general conference sessions, as I mentioned before, take place about uh, every five years constitutionally. But uh, we've had to delay it. Now, you've here's a really interesting thing. And this has this has gone through uh, a whole array of uh, vetting from the General Conference Constitution and Bylaws Committee to its Administrative Committee, to its Executive Committee, the entire Executive Committee, to the Division Executive Committees, to the Union Executive Committees. And what happened was that uh, Tuesday, January 18, we had a special General Conference session at the General Conference headquarters with about uh, 190 uh, delegates being representing or representing, I should say, different divisions. And we voted to change the constitution. It was a very interesting process and very much supported by the world field to change the constitution so that we could have electronic connection by delegates because the constitution does not allow it. Now it does, it was voted unanimously. And just Thursday morning, uh, because of the way the uh, constitutional uh, change is worded, the executive committee has to then make a decision to actually employ the use of that electronic connection. And on Thursday, just Thursday, two days ago, uh, they unanimously accepted that in St. Louis, we will have on-site delegates and we will have delegates who are connected through electronics. So this is a major breakthrough and we praise God for that and for the tremendous support of the world field for that because there will be people and who knows what's gonna happen with uh, COVID-19. Nobody has any idea. I, I thought this would be over in six or, or eight weeks, you know, when March, 2020 happened and 
by May, it'll be done. Well, here we are. So we have no idea what will happen, but if there are travel restrictions, if there are visa problems that people are having, whatever it is, they will still be able to be present as delegates electronically. Now that makes it much more complicated for our technical aspects, but we had a dry run of that for annual council and it worked beautifully. So praise God for that. But that's a little information about general conference. One thing for those who are listening, a little bit later, probably by April, probably April, maybe May, we will announce whether the entire stadium is open for church members to come without restrictions. Uh, at the present time, uh, St. Louis is not requiring social distancing, as I understand it, but we may require masks and that kind of thing. But there's a large stadium, and by God's grace, I hope that thousands of Adventists will be able to come. But we want to be careful and make sure that pro uh, public health protocols are observed because we don't want people getting sick. But that's a little word about the general conference session. All right, All right great. Josiah? Yes, thank you. Because of time, I'm going to skip down a few uh, questions here. I'm trying to look at the chat as well for, for Elder Edmund. Um, how would you respond, uh, Elder Wilson, to the concern of some that African-Americans are underrepresented in leadership positions in the general conference, especially African-Americans from regional conferences? I have a couple of friends of mine who are diversity and inclusion professionals, both of them attorneys. One works for the University of Virginia. Uh, shout out to, to Kevin McDonald. And then one works for Andrews University, Michael Nixon. Um, how would you respond to that concern um, based on sometimes what we see, what we hear, um, that we are underrepresented uh, at the general conference level? Well, that, that's a, a very fair question and uh, an interesting one. You'd have to go back to recognize that uh, for most of the history of the General Conference, uh, there was no North American division. And the North American division and the General Conference were co-mingled. It's only been in the rather recent past that the North American division has been established and kind of come into its own. In fact, we've gone through certain processes in the last uh, two or three years to even help to or, or organize, I should say, financial responsibility where the North American division will come into parity with the other divisions. Eventually, uh, each division will be giving 3% of its tithe towards the sustaining of the general conference. So the North American division is now uh, fully set up and is representational of its group that it is covering. Uh, in terms of the general conference, the general conference has become an incredibly international uh, setting. Uh, years ago, most of the people at the general conference, which included the North American division, were North Americans. Uh, now we have an enormous internationalization of the general conference. So uh, you have... Uh, about 70 nationalities who are currently working at the General Conference headquarters. And even within our own immediate uh, senior leadership, shall we say, uh, we have vice presidents uh, who are from uh, Mexico, from uh, Argentina, uh, from Kazakhstan, uh, from Tanzania, from uh, two from the United States, uh, one being an African-American. Uh, in our immediate uh, senior leadership, just recently, we had a secretary who is of Chinese extraction, a Chinese from Singapore. He has retired. And we had a treasurer who was, is from Dominican Republic, uh, with a mixed heritage and wonderful, excellent leaders. Currently, we have a secretary who's from Brazil and a treasurer, CFO, uh, with roots from Jamaica and from Cuba also. That's what he's told me. Uh, so we have a, and then you have a president who carries an American passport, but as I told you, 
I feel like I'm an Egyptian. So, uh, you know, we, we have an enormous variety of people. Now, I'm going to take a few moments just to tell you about all the world divisions, not all the names and everything, but where they're from. In fact, the North American division is headed by an African-American. I will tell his name, of course, Alex Bryant, a close colleague of mine. We work together closely on many, many different things. Uh, and uh, we have, we have uh, every single division now has its own representation from its own territory. And uh, we have someone from Korea, someone from Myanmar, someone from Australia, someone from India, someone from Russia, uh, someone from Portugal, someone from originally Lebanon, but through Norway, uh, someone from Kenya, someone from Cote d'Ivoire, uh, someone from Zimbabwe, someone from Brazil, someone from Haiti. And all of those represent their constituencies. Now, the president of the, of the North American division and of every division is a vice president of the general conference as well. So we have a huge international setting. Representation cannot take place for every people group everywhere, but by God's grace, the most important aspect is at the local level where people truly are doing mission. And by God's grace, I hope we're all citizens of heaven, first and foremost. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. Let, let me slip in one question before our next commercial. And that is um, a sermon that you preached in Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, I guess about three years ago. Um, a little, little controversial um, where, where you talked about uh, Worship, worship styles and social justice, and um, there, there were there were a number of our constituents who thought that uh, that the sermon was was directed at African American worship styles. So can can you can you kind of share with share with us number one what what was meant in that sermon, and number two, if you can share with us what your position is on social justice. Thank you, Elder Edmund. Uh, I feel very badly that people misinterpreted what I said. Uh, at the time, as I recall, I was not even focusing on African Americans. It could include African Americans, certainly, but we have churches in different parts, probably of the entire world, that, and I'm not talking about format, I'm not talking about order of service, uh, all that. Really, when it gets down to it, there, and this is a very, very touchy subject, I know, but we're talking about music. And there are some places where when you listen to something, you are drawn to the throne room of heaven. There's some other music that is very self-centered and it's drawing attention to the performers. And I, I just... And every church and every individual who's involved, because the general conference and the world church can't legislate this kind of stuff, it has to be done on the personal basis. People have to, in their connection with the Lord and the word of God and the instruction, the spirit of prophecy, help to understand what is it that I can do to bring glory to God. And I mean, there are cultures all throughout this church. I mean, I worship in all kinds of different settings or whatever, uh, and, and you can accept that. But what in the final analysis is bringing glory to God? And you have to go to Revelation 4, for instance, and see where in, in Revelation 4, the, the creatures and the beings there are, are, are in such adoration of God and they're saying, you're worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And what are they saying? Holy, holy, holy. So my plea would simply be, um, you know, take it to the Lord. And if you glorify God, then, the, then God understands that. If you're glorifying yourself and you're doing it for show, 
that's a pretty short-sighted approach. You know, I can remember one particular instance where all of us were drawn to the throne room of heaven. And it was a number of years ago. Some of you may not be acquainted with the name C.L. Brooks. But Elder Brooks was an associate in the Sabbath school department. He was an African-American. And he was an unbelievable singer. I mean, one of the sweetest singers in Israel you would ever hear. And it was at a general conference session and many of us were in mission pageants. We had our costumes and our flags and our banners and whatnot. And then Elder Brooks got up to sing. And Elder Brooks, incidentally, was the chair of the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, the current one that we have. He was the chair of that committee. And he got up and he sang the song, some of you will know it, So Send I You. I mean to tell you, we were about in tears because here we were in a mission pageant and the song was echoing. Now, we don't have to do Western culture songs. We can do any kind of song as long as it's bringing glory to God. So that's my little piece on the music part. Uh, on the social issues and social ills that face us all over the place, uh, absolutely, we need to address as much as we can uh, the challenges. That's what, you know, Jesus was involved. You, you read in, 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 Re, in, in uh, Luke chapter 4, when they gave him the book, when he went into the synagogue, he read from Isaiah, and he was reading about himself and his own ministry, about the ministry that we're supposed to have as we follow Jesus. And he says, it says here that, that he's he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is the work of Seventh-day Adventists to help people. But, and this is where I think people misunderstood, because social issues and social ills and all the challenges that face us in terms of, of, of having uh, dignity and respect for all people, because we must have that. As Seventh-day Adventists, we must stand for that. But the final analysis and what Jesus did was to lead people to him. So whatever you do and whatever you're involved with, it must have as its end result to lead to Jesus. You know, I read from uh, Ministry of Healing and, and Elder Edmund, if we run over a little bit, let's work with that. I'll, I'll work with that. But uh, page 143 from Ministry of Healing, very famous quote. Many of you know this, but this is so powerful. This is, it says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The men mingled with men as one who desired their good. So you got you to gotta be involved. That's again why I'm so grateful to regional conferences for their strong emphasis in reaching the people where they are, not only in rural areas, but cities. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs. Now that's of course where, you know, the ministering to a lot of social challenges come in and won their confidence. So that's great. And then what it says, what does it say? Then he bade them, follow me. So as long as your involvement in helping social situations is concerned, if your end result is to lead people to Jesus, then I think it's a powerful thing. Uh, I think we have to remember, we will never solve all the social ills of the world but we can introduce people to the one who can and will, Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right. Um, thank you, Elder Wilson. I will note that, that these young people are too young to remember Elder Brooks, but I, re I, remember, El I remember Elder Brooks. He, and yeah. you, are, you are right. He had a beautiful voice. Amazing. Uh, so thank so for those of us who are old, thank you for bringing back uh, that memory. Okay, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of your time. Thank you for giving us a few extra moments, but I don't want to abuse that. I, um, Elder Josiah, you had a question. Yeah. 
And we, we really want to get, we really want to address that one. Before, sure. Before we go. Sure. And thank you, Elder Wilson, for sharing your support for for issues on justice. That is good to hear. I'm also a parole director for my conference. Oh, um, great God. Yes, Wonderful. sir. Yes, sir. And so you won't, we you won't find a stronger adherent and that's right. And, and promoter of public affairs and religious liberty. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying I believe. Right. Yes. Yes. So I, I appreciate and I look forward to hearing more from the general conference when we do have to take stands here in the, in the U.S., especially against police brutality, et cetera, et cetera. And we appreciate uh, that support. I've got a question for you. There are some uh, who believe, even though you sound very supportive of regional conferences, um, there are some who believe that they should be eliminated, um, even though. Uh, our our leaders back in the 30s and the 40s desired to be integrated. That's what we our leaders wanted. Um, it was a general conference executive committee that voted separation, let the colored work, you know, have, start their own conferences. So in light of that background, what is your position on the need for regional conferences and should they be eliminated? Well, many people know that the regional conferences that you alluded to uh, Pastor Josiah, were started at a time when there was there was real challenge and difficulty. And, you know, we'll leave that there because we look at things now. The regional conferences uh, have such a powerful uh, role to play in helping with evangelism, with outreach, with nurture of individuals in the African-American community. And uh, they give tremendous uh, support in so many ways to the mission outreach of the church. Uh, I don't think if you look in any um, journals or in any meetings that you will find the general conference uh, in the last number of years uh, indicating anything like what you have suggested about being eliminated. I believe that regional conferences can play a vital and are playing a very vital part. One thing I would like to encourage the regional conferences to continue to do, and that uh, has been a hallmark of regional conferences. In fact, I wish the entire world field, and especially in North America, that you would focus on evangelism. That's what has shown so powerfully in the African-American and regional conference uh, setting. And I know that Elder Bryant, uh, division president, uh, has a great desire to shift the focus on, on tremendous evangelistic outreach in this vast division of, I think it's about 360 million people in the North American division. And I am so grateful for what, uh, the regional conferences are doing in that area. So I think we need to work together to focus on finishing the work. And uh, I think that God is going to help us to do that. All thank right. You. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Elder Wilson. Um, we're down to our last three questions for the sake of time. Um, our educator always, always pushes us to ask something on education. So I know, I know you have education question. Uh, Dr. Re Dr. Rebecca. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I do. So, of course, we know the importance of education. So I'd like to know, well, the people would like to know um, about the role that the General Conference plays in education. Well, um, Ms. Jackson, Sister Jackson, uh, Dr. Jackson, soon to be. Um, what a privilege to be able to have the second largest worldwide system of education. The only other education system that is more expansive is in the Roman Catholic Church, interestingly. And so Seventh-day Adventists believe in education. Uh, we believe in following, uh, you know, uh, Christ's methods. He taught people physically, helped them physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. And the mental part of it is so important. It's not just the academic acquisition. It is the spiritual foundation that you get in a Seventh-day Adventist school. 
And um, I would encourage all people who are who have their students there at Seventh-day Adventist in institutions to support them, to encourage them, and to nurture that spiritual element. You know, if our schools don't offer that, they're not much different than the rest of the public schools and secular schools. So that aspect is so powerful, the, the mission focus, the spiritual focus, the, the biblical foundation. The, the General Conference helps to coordinate this large system through, as I was explaining to Pastor Josiah, all this different, these different layers, you know, of administration. And we have very strong educational directors at different levels uh, so that those institutions will stay focused on their mission and also be financially viable. Today, it's getting very difficult to continue Seventh-day Adventist education when educational costs are skyrocketing. So we have to be so innovative in trying to help contain those costs in order to continue to provide for as many students as possible. But the general conference itself, as it helps to supervise the system, because elementary schools are run by local conferences as well as academies or secondary schools. Uh, colleges are generally run by unions, sometimes by divisions. Universities are generally run by divisions, and we have a couple uh, at the General Conference, uh, Loma Linda University and Andrews University. But uh, the General Conference Department of Education helps to keep the standards very high. They make all kinds of site visits. Uh, they are able to encourage uh, institutions, primarily uh, the tertiary and secondary institutions uh, in terms of their standards and spiritual development. They also have a what we call the Adventist Accrediting Association, AAA, which helps to uh, make sure that these institutions are living up to not only the spiritual standards, but also the academic standards uh, according to Seventh-day Adventist uh, standards. And uh, we have the International Board of Education, which involves all the world divisions. We have the International Board of Theological, uh, Ministerial and Theological Education, which helps to monitor and make sure that uh, theological education is, is kept in a very focused way on the Word of God and uh, the Seventh-day Adventist message. So our education department is a very professional, spiritual, dedicated group, but they are running ragged because we're getting so many schools that it's pretty hard to cover it. But by God's grace, they're doing that. So let's pray for our teachers, especially during this COVID pandemic. It's really caused so much uh, challenge within our educational system, but it is absolutely vital, one of the most vital things about the Adventist church. Okay, let's, with Elder Wilson, if uh, we want to be respectful of your time, um, I will, you, you've been kind enough to extend, extend your time beyond uh, the, the, the 6.30 East Coast time, uh, but we will close, if you'll allow us to uh, take one final question from the audience, you, you spoke about um, the dignity of all uh, humankind and how the Adventist church needs to stand for that. We, we appreciate that. Um, how, how, how would you address though the, um, the, the fact that, that there still is, there still are um, signs of racism in the Seventh-day Adventist church. So how, how would you address that? What would, what would you, what can you do as the leader of our church specifically to address that scourge? Well, first of all, uh, you find that all over the world. And uh, it can take on the form of uh, uh, tribalism, uh, different uh, sections of countries, in fact, different ethnic groups uh, within a country. Uh, and certainly the United States has that uh, challenge as well. 
uh, I think in terms of our own personal approach, each of us has to make sure that we show the utmost respect to people. And when we see that respect is not being provided, we need to say, no, let's correct that. Let's do what we can to make sure that things are, are appropriate. Um, I'll take a little, a little illustration. Um, and I have to give credit to the hospital system, uh, the Adventist healthcare system in the Washington DC area. Uh, there was a very terrible thing that happened in the old Washington Sanitarium and Hospital back in the 1940s. And a dear sister called uh, Lucy Byard, who came from New York, was refused treatment at the Washington Sanitarium and Hospital because she was a woman of color. And she then went to a hospital she was referred to a hospital that was connected with Howard University, and then subsequently she died. Now, I think she had a, an illness, which she was hoping could be cured, but unfortunately she died. That has festered as a blot on the church for some almost 75, 80 years. Recently, the healthcare system and its president, uh, developed a special committee that worked on how can we at this point in time try to at least bring some encouragement. You can't erase what happened, but you can bring some encouragement. They had a, a service uh, in the Washington area that was a very moving service. And they shared how this was wrong uh, and how they hoped to at least bring some encouragement, so to speak. Uh, they had a very uh, famous African-American painter paint a beautiful picture of Lucy Bayard. Bayard. And uh, it is a lovely picture. And it's going to hang in the White, White Oak Medical Center, which is now the the result of the Washington Sanitarium and Hospital, they've moved, Washington Adventist Hospital, it's moved to a different location. It's gonna hang there in the, the foyer with an, a, an explanation and all of that. But you know, that's just a physical thing. They went much further than that and they have established scholarships for nursing students of color. And they have contributed $500,000 to that scholarship fund to help young people counteract what was such a miserable blot on the past. Now, is that going to erase what happened? No, it was wrong, but they've done something very positive. And uh, that uh, scholarship will be available to those who apply from Washington Adventist University from uh, Oakwood University and from Howard University. Now, people might say, well, why include Howard University? Well, it's interesting that uh, the Adventist health system is actually now in a contractual arrangement with Howard University to run their medical center. In fact, I attended this event uh, recently that took place and I sat next to the CEO of that medical center in Howard, Uni Howard University, an African-American. And uh, so recently, our esteemed uh, chief financial officer, uh, Paul Douglas, who has now been our treasurer for the last six months or eight months or so since Juan Prestol retired, uh, he was there also. And he came up to me and says, you know, we need to contribute also to this. And I agreed with him. And we just last week brought a proposal in and it was voted with such enthusiasm to contribute $150,000 to that. And the North American division took up the challenge that Paul talked with them about. They have contributed $150,000. So that scholarship now will be $800,000 for nursing students of color. And the Adventist Hospital has guaranteed 
that anyone who graduates from that program at any one of those three universities will be guaranteed a job within the Adventist health system, helping to bring healing to people. Now, I mention that because it's just a little instance of how we can approach a situation of the past and of the, and of the present and try to make the world a better place. Um, you know, um, you may have some additional question, Elder Am Edmund, but I want to I want to share at least in closing one of the most incredible experiences I've had in the recent past, having to do with the power of God changing the heart, and that's what we need. You see, Second Corinthians chapter five talks about the ministry of reconciliation. And that is what the church needs. And that's what we have been promoting and encouraging. Uh, in our annual council of uh, 2021, we spent considerable time with the entire executive committee on the whole aspect of dignity, of racism, of tribalism, of showing uh, respect to people. Uh, our PARL director, uh, Ganun Diop, uh, who is from Senegal and a, and a very good friend of mine, uh, he shared as well as many others. And uh, it, was a, it was a helpful experience for everybody. But whenever you're ready, I want to tell a story. And I know, you know, I, I, I've told you we'll take a little more time because this story is so precious to me and it's such a beautiful understanding about reconciliation. But if there's anything else we need to do before I tell that, I'm, I'm waiting. Okay. Well, here's what we'll do. Um, we'll go to the last question, which deals with mission, and then we'll allow we'll we'll allow you, Mr. President, to close with your story. And by the way, um, I was I was there at the program for Lucy Byard. It was, you're right. It was a very moving um, experience. As a matter of fact, it was there where I asked you to come on this program. Uh, so, um, and, and I thank you for the general conference adding on to this 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 very this very um, fine program. All right, let's 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 deal. Let's let's ask the last question, and then Elder Wilson, you have the last word. <laughs> well, Doctor Wilson, is there anything that you would like your administration to accomplish that has never been accomplished before? Well, that's a huge question, and I really am going to defer to um, to those who watch and see what happens because it's not about me; it's about our church members. And uh, you know, we've had a lot of wonderful things happen. Uh, we have emphasized revival and reformation. Uh, we've emphasized total member involvement, everybody doing something for Jesus. And, and really, I suppose if that were something that could be remembered, uh, I would think that would be one of the biggest things. And also the emphasis on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. In fact, I cannot emphasize it enough. The word of God is the foundation of everything that we do and stand for. And the spirit of prophecy is one of the greatest gifts given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I hope that people who are maybe a bit skeptical about the spirit of prophecy, uh, that they will just read it. I mean, right now, I'm in the process of reading uh, from Patriarchs and Prophets, from Welfare Ministry. If you want a book that's going to turn your life around in terms of helping with social ills and issues. I mean, this book is really pointed and very uh, encouraging. And I'm also, when I walk, I, I try to, you know, in the wintertime and today it was pretty cold and a little snowy and all that, but I didn't walk this morning, but yesterday I did. I try to walk a couple of miles a day. And while I walk, generally, I will listen to uh, the spirit of prophecy and scripture on online. I can just, and anybody can do it. You can download uh, the Bible, of course, and the spirit of prophecy. And I'm, I'm in, I'm, I'm going through the testimonies for the church right now, and I'm in volume five. Uh, and it's, it's amazing stuff. 
It's not antiquated stuff that, you know, nobody cares. It's amazing if you just read it. And it, it just is so encouraging. So the scripture and the, and the spirit of prophecy, I think that's so important for our church members to understand. I mean, uh, Ms. Jackson, I'm, I'm a pastor. So I'm not looking for lots of accolades for me. I just want to lift up Jesus. And I want us to go home. I look around here. I'll tell you, uh, all of you, uh, El Pastor Edmund, Pastor Josiah, uh, Rebecca, uh, I really believe Jesus is coming soon. I see stuff happening all over the place. And I may see some interesting things that some people don't even see. And it just tells me that the world is coming to a point where revelation is going to be fulfilled in such a powerful way. And we need to be leaning on the Lord so much. Otherwise, we'll get all sidetracked into all kinds of challenges and, and we'll lose our, our focus. And our focus is, is Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ministry in the most holy place right now as our high priest and and our coming king he is our all in all and we ought to lift up jesus in all that we do and everything that uh, that he represents but i'm excited about you know things like uh the communication methods that we're using now covid has taught us one thing we can get the message out in a much more powerful way electronically than we ever thought of before and uh, it's happening, all kinds of amazing things. Uh, also, the, the Great Controversy Project 2.0, where we hope to distribute millions of copies of the Great Controversy electronically and a hard copy. Now, some people might say, oh, why are you going to pass out that book? That's too, too uh, specific. It's, well, Ellen White said she wished that book to be circulated more than any other book. And that has brought so many people to the foot of the cross. It's just an incredible book. So, you know, if you want to give out Steps to Christ, praise the Lord. That was my dad's, one of my dad's favorite books, and it's one of mine too. But Great Controversy, what an um, appealing book to people today especially. And all kinds of other things that we're, we're doing, Mission to the Cities and Comprehensive Health Ministry and all that kind of thing, and saying, Yes, Lord, I will go. Because, you know, you, you read in, in Isaiah chapter 6, it says uh, in the last section there of verse 8, uh, it says, whom shall I send? God is saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Which I think is an interesting thing also. Us, which is plural, we believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And together they're saying, who's going to go for us? And it says... Uh, dear, dear Isaiah said he was so amazed by God's redemptive power for him. I mean, you can read that in the first part of Isaiah 6, that he says, here I am, send me, you know, I'll go, send me. And that's what we all need to do. When we work together as a powerful, wonderful, harmonious family focused on the mission of the church and pray for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit, we're going to see unbelievable things happen. And I believe, not just in the lifetime of Ms. Jackson, but in some of us who are a little older, our lifetime, I believe we're going to see Jesus come. Now, I just want to share with you an amazing story. About five years ago, Adventist World Radio decided to uh, send radio programs uh, by radio into the island of Mindoro in the Philippines. Now, you need to know that uh, Mindoro and a number of other islands have had revolutionary forces there fighting for years against the national government. On Mindoro, they had a group of people who were communists, atheists, and that's important, atheists for the story, and sponsored by communists. Over the course of 52 years on the island of Mindoro, 40,000 people have been killed because 
of that conflict. Mm. Well, about in the last four or five years, these radio messages started to go into Mindoro. And about two years ago, somehow, because our Adventist World Radio Coordinator for the Philippines had a bright idea. He said, let's ask a question of the day. And if you respond to that question of the day and get it right, you'll get a prize. People started listening like crazy. And it was amazing how successful the radio program became. Unbeknownst to most people, the rebels in the rugged mountains of the interior of Mindoro, and let me tell you, they are rugged. I haven't walked in them, but I've flown over them. It's really rugged. The rebels were listening to these broadcasts. And those hardened rebels, atheists, were their hearts were melted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And they contacted the Adventist World Radio coordinator. His name is Robert Dulai. And they, they talked with Pastor Robert and they said, can you come and talk with us? Can you, this kind of thing. He went up and he met with them. He gave them Bible studies. He talked with them. They decided to give their hearts to the Lord, to turn in their weapons, oh. to surrender to the national government. And amazingly, the national government gave them all amnesty. Oh. Because wow. in the past 52 years, they have tried bribery, violence, you know, force. Let's put it that way. The National Army and everything else. Nothing has worked. But the gospel of Jesus Christ did. The Adventist message touched their hearts. And it was my privilege recently. And it was a huge breakthrough because we couldn't even get into the country of Philippines because of COVID. I mean, let me tell you, uh, traveling around the world is not nearly as glamorous as most people like to think it is. But traveling in COVID-19 is almost miserable. It's messy and complicated. PCR tests and regulations and you got to do this and that. And of course, wearing masks and the whole thing. And they weren't even allowing uh, foreigners into the uh, country of Philippines. But through a lot of connections, we were able to get in. Uh, a wonderful ambassador who is a Seventh-day Adventist and interceding. And anyway, in any case, we were able to preach to those people who surrendered their weapons. And now the National Army is protecting them. Can you believe it? And they are, they, they hug each other now. Whereas they were trying to eliminate each other, they are now brothers and sisters in the faith and in humanity. That's what the power of the gospel can do. While I was preaching to them in an evangelistic kind of a capstone of their journey, and uh, we were out kind of in a rural area uh, under the trees, basically, and there were like 400 plastic chairs out there and then others were sitting all around and uh, they had signs where these people were to sit and they said fr well what's fr means former rebels so all the former rebels were to sit there and listen to this guy from america preach to them well it began to rain and most of them stayed there and it rained harder more of them disappeared and then it really rained. And I mean, I think there were about six people left. One guy put a chair over his head. He was going to stay. But these other people went into little shelters around. And I didn't know it. But they were listening. There were about a thousand people there listening in all these shelters and everything. And, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, Pastor Edmund, Pastor Josiah, when you're preaching, you know, what are you going to do? And it's raining. Well, you get kind of discouraged when you look out and you see... 400 empty plastic chairs, basically. But then you say, no, I came here to preach. I'm going to preach. So I preached. I found out the next day that these former rebels went to the commanding general of the National Army, who's protecting them now. And they said, you know what? Usually people just quit when we have all this rain. 
but they kept preaching. This must be an important message for us. Mm. And I was preaching on Daniel 2 and the statue and all the, the whole history of the world and all that kind of thing. On Sabbath, that was on a Thursday. Well, I should say on Friday because this is important and I'll wrap it up here in a moment or so. On Friday, my wife really gave me, you know, some real talking to. Uh, you know, our spouses can really help us understand certain things at times. Yours too. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And she said, you, they are not former rebels. That's like saying Paul was a former murderer. No, these are new creatures in Jesus Christ. They shouldn't be called former rebels. So I got up on Friday night. I said, you know, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you are no longer former rebels. You are new creatures in Jesus Christ. Oh, they clapped. They were so excited. Now they have changed the nomenclature so that FR does not stand for former rebels. It stands for fully reconciled. It's good. It's good. On Sabbath, we were greatly privileged to baptize... 700 former rebels who are now fully reconciled. Mm -hmm. What a joy to see those people baptized. I had the privilege of baptizing the general of those former rebels who are now fully reconciled. And Nancy and I continued throughout Philippines. I want to tell you, our Filipino people are so evangelistically motivated. We held meetings in central Philippines because that was in the north. We then in Central, we went down to the South, uh, Mindanao, where we have over 700,000 Seventh-day Adventists in one union in South Philippines. And because of these efforts of evangelism during COVID, God has blessed our church members because they were doing small care groups and all that. And then we were broadcasting through Hope Channel and all that. Because of that effort, over the last six months or so, over 100,000 people have been baptized and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church as your brothers and sisters. Wow. To me, this is just a thrilling experience. And that's what it means to truly be fully reconciled. I praise God for the opportunity of being part of it. And I appeal to all of us to focus on the mission God has given to us to prepare people through the power of the Holy Spirit for Jesus soon coming. And the regional conferences will play a major part in that. A powerful story, Mr. President. Thank you so much for your time uh, you uh, yes. and for sharing that story of reconciliation and what the power of the gospel does. And that's what we're all about. We want to pray for you um, um, before you go. And then we'll close out with uh, what's going to happen next week. So, Elder Josiah, would you pray for Elder Wilson, please? Sure, sure. Father God, we thank you this evening for the opportunity that we've had to dialogue uh, with Elder Wilson, president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. We thank you for the time he took out with 13 divisions and 22 million people around the world to be here with us. Uh, and Lord, I'm also praying that this would not just be the only time that we would be able to to have a conversation with him uh but but we will have another time uh, where we can sit down together um and lord you believe in reconciliation you have given us the ministry of reconciliation and i pray oh god that you would allow our our president uh to be able to lead the charge in reconciling those uh, of us who may have not just differences of opinions, Lord, but others uh, who have been ostracized and marginalized. Continue to bless him and his wife uh, as they lead our church. Give him wisdom and understanding. Give him discernment. Oh, God, give him a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and Lord, I pray that we would all be locked in uh, on finishing uh, this work, uh, preaching this everlasting gospel uh, so that you can return soon. Uh, so we can see you in peace. That is our prayer. Dismiss us, Lord, not uh, from your presence, uh, but from this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Again, again, Elder Wilson, thank you so much for being with us. And may the Lord bless you as you continue to lead our church. 
God bless each one of you, and Lord be with you. With Amen. 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 All right. Um, thank you, Elder Josiah and Miss Jackson. Let's find out what's going on uh, next week. Next week will be our uh, normal first Sabbath. And uh, um, yes, thank you. Upcoming events. All right. Uh, next week, uh, Black Churches Matter uh, is our Black. Next week is Black History, uh, beginning of Black History Month. There are some churches doing some amazing things, and we want to share. We want to next week. We want to share what those church are doing, churches are doing, and the differences that they are making for the kingdom of God. Uh, we want to continue to remind you of our blood regional blood drive. Um, there are lives that we believe can be saved in this life, and impressions for the life to come. Uh, so. Uh, please keep that in mind as well. Uh, next month we begin the your your conference in your conferences and the West Coast and our regional conference retirees um, are have been given uh, um, a a study guide on on uh, on on social justice and the Word of God. Um, Dr. Calvin Rock, former General Conference Vice President, former President of Oakwood, he and a number of our scholars have led out in that, and those um, we will begin to use this as a complement to your regular Sabbath school uh, quarterly during the month of February, and we appreciate the Regional Conference for making that possible. Um, pandemic pressures. The, this is a podcast from the Allegheny East Conference uh, that will happen tomorrow at 6 p.m. Allegheny West, um, the healthy leader, and that is a, a that is a leadership uh, uh, program for our lay folks. Um, it, what whatever this is pretty much comprehensive. Whatever ministry you involved in, uh, you can. Um, you can participate in that and receive training for mission. Uh, on the couch with Dr. Kim, Kim Logan Nolan, my cla my former classmate at Oakwood. Um, um, we're talking about maintaining mental illness in the midst of a pandemic. That will be Friday, February the 11th, and you can watch it live. Uh, um, and you see the address down there, the web address at the bottom of your screen. Estate planning, uh, particularly for our Ministerial Spouses Association, they, um, they're doing a workshop in Northeastern. You see the time, which is five o'clock. Now, what I don't, oh, February the 6th. I was looking for the, for the date, uh, February the 6th. Um, and... Uh, please keep that in mind. And there you see the uh, passcode. Uh, this is done via Zoom. All right. South Atlantic has their their annual marriage lovers retreat. Um, and that's going to be inside Stone Mountain Park, February 18 to 20. Um, this is something they've been doing for a long time. And um, I've had relatives to attend it. And, and have spoken very highly of it. All right, that brings us to the end of our commercials and to the end of our program. Elder Josiah prayed for Elder, uh, Elder Wilson. We're going to consider that as our closing prayer. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, again, we thank uh, the president of our World Church, Dr. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Elder Josiah, for filling in for Pastor Hoy. Thank you, sure. Ms. Jackson. We'll see you next week for Elder Josiah El and Ms. Jackson. I'm Elder Edmund. Thank you for being with us. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.